So, good morning, everybody. My name is uh, Francois Bégin. For those who don't know me, I'm uh, one of the EMS fellow, and I'm uh, also one of the uh, emergency staff, the one with the funny French accent. So, um, today, I just want to take one minute to survey the audience. Is there any PGY5 in the room? This is what I expected. So, uh, they, they, they did their exam yesterday. I'm pretty sure they did well, so I just want to take one minute to congratulate uh, your uh, PGY5 for their uh, their achievement, so it is a great achievement they did yesterday. So today I decided to talk about inhalation injuries. Uh, my interest into this topic came from uh, some experiences I had with the uh, EMS Falls this year. So we got, uh, I spent a lot of time reading on CBRNE during the EMS month. Uh, some PGY3 in the room will remember that. I also had a chance to uh, spend some time with the ASMAT firefighter team in the city of Ottawa. We've been with the uh, OPP par uh, tactical paramedic uh, uh, as well, and we also spent a week at the uh, uh, Counterterrorism Technology Center in Southfield, Alberta, which is the big CBRNE center uh, in Canada. So, with all this experience, uh, that uh, my interest came from these experiences. So, I, de I decided today to share this uh, with you. So, I know that inhalation injuries—it's a very, very wide topic. So I decided to uh, not cover some, uh, some of the topics, so uh, especially in regard to smoke inhalation, carbon monoxide, and cyanide. I know it has been covered last year at Grand Round, and uh, more recently at Cache Round, so I decided not to talk about it. And uh, so most of my presentation is going to be around chemical irritants, which is to me uh, one of the most common presentation and also one of the most interesting and challenging uh, part of the inhalation injuries. So today, the goals are, I want you to understand the mechanism of toxicity of the inhalation injuries. I want to discuss of the treatment options and their controversies. I want you to know the complication of some inhalants. I want you to be able to support the EMS providers with exposed patients. And also, I want you to be prepared for a surge of patients with inhalation injuries in your emergency department. So this is my goals. So, just to test a bit the knowledge, uh, I, I want to do a pretest. So, I'm going to ask in the audience uh, to raise your hand uh, because I have a couple of questions for you. So, first question in regard to water solubility, can you place this gas on the line? So, A, it's low water solubility, B is intermediate, and C is high water solubility. So, just raise your hand when, uh, when you think it is the, the right answer. So, ammonia. Is ammonia it's a low water solubility? Intermediate? High? Good. Ogene. Low? Intermediate? High? Not bad. H2S, hydrogen sulfide. Is it a low? Intermediate? It's always a good answer. Intermediate. <laughs> And high, nice. Chlorine, low, intermediate, high, yes. Nitrogen dioxide, NO2, is it low, intermediate, or high? And finally, chloramine, is it low, intermediate, or high? Interesting, so yes, you're gonna learn a few things today. Yes, <laughs> I'm happy. So, other question. Which of these gas can be treated with, uh, by inducing methemoglobinemia? Is it A, chlorine, B, ammonia, C, NO2, D, H2S, or E, phosgene? Uh, not so sure. Okay, so we're going to see that. Other question. What is the best treatment to decrease pain following a pepper spray exposure? Is it A, baby shampoo? B, lidocaine gel, C, malox, D, soap and water, E, milk. Milk, a few rands. And what's the treatment for symptomatic patient following chlorine exposure? Is it A, support, B, salbutamol, C, corticosteroids, D, nebulized uh, sodium bicarb, 
or E, all of the above. Interesting. Okay. So that's the end of the pretest. So why should we talk about inhalation injuries? I think we should talk about it because there is so many potential exposure all around us. Could be uh, domestic, occupational, recreational, uh, industrial, natural catastrophe, transportation accident. So there is many, many potential sources of exposure. Also, most of the patient you're gonna see are gonna be very mildly irritating following a throwing exposure. It's gonna be your bread and butter. But sometimes you're gonna have to uh, face a patient with airway obstruction following a high water solubility retent. And uh, some people will have pulmonary edema. They can be very ill. So uh, it, it could be very challenging. So I think it's, it's one of the reasons why we should talk about it. Another thing, very interesting thing, is uh, a single event can create a real mass casualty event. So you can have dozens and hundreds of victims following a one single incident. So this is very challenging from an ED point of view and also for an EMS service. Uh, it is a threat for the first responder. There is many, many reports of first responder being victim of contamination on the site, on the scene. Uh, so again, this is something that we're gonna talk about today. And finally, it's a threat for you, your emergency and your staff and your patient. Because if you got contaminated patient coming in your eMERGE, following chlorine or uh, pepper spray exposure, they're gonna make everybody, uh, every COPD and asthmatic patient in the room, they compensate it because of that. So you should be aware of secondary contamination. And again, we're gonna talk about it. So just one example of what it could be like. Uh, this is an example in 2005 in uh, Graniteville, South Carolina. It was a train uh, derailment. Uh, so basically the train transported some big chlorine tanks and there is a massive leak of chlorine. There was nine deaths and they got 2,150 victims treated following chlorine exposure, which is massive. So you can imagine that this big event is not very frequent, but it can happen. It can happen here. So because in some situation you may have to uh, decontaminate your patient, I just want to make a small review of the PPE, just one slide. So there is four levels of PPE. Level A is the fully encapsulated chemical resistant suit. Under the suit, the first responder will wear a SCBA, a self-contained breathing apparatus. It's like a big CPAP that firefighters use. And uh, this is the level A protection. This is the best protection. This is uh, intended for the uh, first responder who work in the hot zone. They also can work in the low FiO2 environment and it is safe for them. Level B is just in between. You get the same respiratory uh, protection with the SCBA but you don't have the full encapsulated suit, so you just have a small suit, the one you used to use uh, here at the hospital, which is the level C suit. Uh, so it's just in between, level A protection and level C suit, so it's in between, it's a level B. And finally, the level C. The level C is the, the suit you should use when you want to decontaminate any bad chemical. Uh, it, is, uh, it is intended, yes, so for hospital response or hospital decontamination, uh, it is a chemical resistance suit. It is splash resistant, and uh, it also have a mask with uh, ACR, uh, APC, uh, uh, APR, which is an air purifying respirator. Uh, it consists of two small cartridge. So um, this, uh, to use this mask, this mask, sorry, you should be fit tested. So I would just want to survey the audience. Uh, I don't know if you remember, but last month, uh, Dr. Wilmore uh, asked you to get fit tested for level CPP. Thank you, Dr. Wilmore. It is very important that everybody get fit tested. So can you raise your hand, those who get fit tested? Perfect, so we, we still have work to do. Uh, it is important that everybody get fit tested because I'm sure this is gonna happen. We don't know when, if, maybe next month. Who knows? So I got, sorry. I will propose you five cases, five different cases. And I will ask questions at the beginning of the, of the cases and you just can answer in your mind, uh, try to, to figure out what you will do in that specific situation. So you probably remember the, uh, uh, all the protests that happened in Montreal last year with the students. 
Uh, I don't know, but the, the, the uh, scholar fees in Ontario are much higher than in Quebec, so sometimes the student get uh, maybe going to change their mind and they, they're going to be uh, as rebel, rebel? Can I say rebel in, in English? <laughs> yes, I got my translator in the room. <laughs> yes. And started to uh, protest against the tuition fees. So just a situation. September 2013, there is a student protest in King Edward. The crowd became more agitated, and police officers had to use riot control agents to contain the situation. You receive a patch. You are the general. <laughs> so there is a tactical medic uh, that just call you and say, hey, doc, uh, I don't have any requests for you. I just want to tell you, uh, here in King Edward, it is a nightmare. Uh, police officers spray everybody. Everybody was tearing, coughing, irritating, so it's, uh, again, it's a nightmare. So I just want to tell you that we got hundreds of patients, very symptomatic patients. They told you that, yeah, we try to decontaminate uh, a lot of them, but maybe some will present to the eMERGE to uh, have medical attention, to have some uh, symptom relief or whatever they, they need. So they just tell you that. Questions? What are the substances used by police officers for riot control? Can you answer that question? What is the ALS-PCS protocol for riot control agent exposure? How do you prepare for this surge of patients? Do you want to decontaminate the patients? If so, how do you want to proceed? And what kind of PPE do you need for riot control agents? And finally, what complications you should expect? So, let's talk about riot control agents. Basically, there is three different agents used. Two uh, are used in the uh, civilian setting and one only in the uh, army. So the first one is OC. OC is known as pepper spray. It's audioresin audio capsicum. It is extracted from uh, Cheyenne, Cheyenne uh, pepper. And basically, police officers use a handheld device that just spray some fine droplets in the face of the protestants or the, or the bad guys. And it is not a gas, it's just some small liquid droplets. So these droplets can be either water-based or oil-based, and they tend to stick on the skin and the clothes. And this can be an issue for secondary contamination of your eMERGE, because they're gonna, the contaminant is going to stay on, on the patient. In comparison, there is the CS. CS is the tear gas. Tear gas uh, is used with a grenade, so they just throw the grenade uh, in the crowd, and it releases a big, big cloud of small particles. And uh, again, this is kind of a small powder, very fine powder, so it's n it doesn't stick to the clothes, and after a few minutes, just the cloud disappear and natu naturally decontaminate the patients. So the decontamination will be a bit different between uh, OC and CS, but we're going to talk about it. There is also the CN. The CN is the mace. Mace is not used in the civilian setting anymore. Uh, there was too much ocular toxicity, and there is five reported deaths related to mace uh, because of a high exposure, bronchospasm, pulmonary edema, and the patient died for that. So because of these deaths and the ocular toxicity, they decided just to remove the uh, CN from the market. Both OC and CS got similar uh, characteristics, so it is a rapid onset, few seconds, and usually the duration of effect is less than 30 minutes. It's very quick. The goal of these agents is just to disorient the bad guy. So when they got tears in, the, in their eyes, they are blind for a few seconds, so they are not able to resist, and they're more easy to control. And <laughs> There is side effects of these molecules. So for the eyes, there is a lot of pain in the eyes, tearing, blepharospasm, so they get blind a few minutes, a few seconds, I, I should say. Uh, over the skin, the upper respiratory tract, there is some erythema, some burning sensation, hypersalivation. And some people will react a little bit more over the lungs with coughing, shortness of breath, and chest tightness. People with massive exposure could have uh, nausea and vomiting as well. So. This is just uh, an, an interesting slide for, the, uh, for me. I'm sorry for my bias. I like the pre-hospital medicine. So I just want you to know that there is some medical directives for uh, paramedic for 
chemical exposure. So not everybody know that, so I want you to know that. Uh, basically, uh, some ACP are trained with CBRNE training, and they are, uh, they are able to use these medical directives uh, for hydrofluoric acid, so they can provide calcium, nerve agents, they can give the uh, auto-injector antidote, cyanide, they can give uh, hydroxocobalamin, and RC agents. So they get protocols for each of these uh, chemical uh, exposure. In regard to the uh, riot control agents, uh, they got a specific procedure for decontamination. Uh, they assess for broken castration. They can treat with salbutamol if needed. They assess uh, visual acuity. They remove contact lenses. They can put some uh, uh, anesthetic drops in the eyes, and they are trained to do ocular irrigation. And then reassessment of the vital signs. So if a medic can do that on scene, this patient will not come in your emerge. So it is very useful. But in case of a big event, Medic will be overwhelmed, and they won't be able to do the formal process for everybody. So you should expect people to come in your emerge without being decontaminated by the medics. So how do you prepare your emerge if you, oops, if you uh, expect to receive massive uh, uh, arrival of uh, a lot of patients? In fact. Uh, you should avoid secondary contamination. So you don't want your eMERGE to be contaminated with pepper spray. Uh, so try to uh, find a way to lock your hospital uh, at the main entrance, at the triage. Make sure to put all the contaminated patients together and get uh, a formal decon process. The level of protection you should use, uh, it's a level D+. Plus. That means that you, should, you, 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 don't, you don't need to wear the full level CPP with the mask. Usually with pepper spray or, or uh, tear gas, just a level D plus could be sufficient. I mean that you should wear um, surgical gown, latex gloves, glasses, and mask at N95, and it could be sufficient just to avoid any inhalation of particles. Because again, tear gas is a misnomer. It's not a gas, it's particles. It's not like uh, chlorine, which is a real gas. Mace or uh, tear gas is more like particles. So uh, N95 is going to be sufficient. For the decon, uh, maybe some hint here. Uh, when, you, when you want to decon this patient, it's better to cut the clothes because you don't want to just, just uh, pull over the clothes and contaminate your face, the air, etc. So it's just better to cut and to open the clothes. This is one thing uh, uh, that is important. And uh, air. It is... Uh, Recommended to decontaminate patient with tear gas with uh, a fan and some air, blowing hair, because it's just going to remove all the, the small powder. Uh, but when you're on scene, it is the way uh, technical medic they get decontaminated. And most patients, just with time, going to get decontaminated just by walking around and uh, adding some air blowing around. Uh, so this is for tear gas. But for the pepper spray, it's a bit different because, as I said, it's, it could be oil-based, so it's going to stick on the clothes. So it's be better to do full decontamination, cutting clothes, shower uh, with soap and water. So the question, what's the best treatment to decrease pain following pepper spray exposure? Is it milk, baby shampoo, na na na? So they did a real blind study. That means that they, they make sure that every patient was blind by the OC spray. So they, they, they found 49 law enforcement patients. Uh, they spray them in the face, uh, and there is five treatment groups. Milk, lidocaine, water, malox, and baby shampoo. Guess what? They, uh, they check the, uh, the pain assessment every 10 minutes, and basically there is no difference. Everybody get happy after 60 minutes. So bottom line, whatever you do, just time going to be uh, the key. So, the, these patients have access initially with water decon, so they just take a soak uh, towel with water, they, they just uh, uh, put it on their face two minutes, and then they have access to one of these five treatments. So basically, if you got a regular decon with water initially, time gonna be enough after. So you don't have to put a specific uh, stuff on the skin or whatever. So that's it. Couple complications following RC exposure. First is reactive airway dysfunction syndrome, RADS. Basically, RADS, uh, I will summarize by saying that it is just a asthma exacerbation on a non asthmatic patient following an inhalation exposure, basically. So, if you got any patient having bronchospasm following inhalation and is, this patient is not asthmatic, we should consider it as a RADS. 
So RAS is one of the complications for RCE exposure. The other complication is skin blistering. This guy on the right side uh, spent all day in a small room with uh, uh, tear gas. Uh, he was one of the instructors um, in the uh, mass confidence room. They call that uh, like this. Uh, and basically, he didn't decontaminate himself after the day and he developed uh, secondary burns uh, over the skin. So this should be treated as secondary chemical burns. Other, other complication is contact dermatitis. It, will, it won't be acute. It's going to be uh, with somebody with persistent erythema following exposure. So it could be the day after or a couple of days after. So it should be treated as contact dermatitis with corticosteroids. Finally, uh, the most important thing for you is to check for ocular complication. The complication seen the most often is impaction with uh, solid particles. The other one is abrasion, because people are going to rub their eyes as hell, so they're going to be, uh, they, they are at risk of having abrasions, and also chemical burns. So just do a good uh, slit lamp exam following exposure if patient is still symptomatic from an ocular point of view. So that closed the RCA case. Excellent. So let's talk about chlorine. So this happened last year. I don't know if you remember. It happened at Calypso Park. So it can happen again. Uh, July 2013, you get a patch from the paramedic team leader. Uh, he told you that there is a chlorine release at Calypso Park uh, during the maintenance. And there is about 20 casualties uh, complaining of burning sensation, blurry vision, coughing, wheezing, uh, and yeah. So question. How do you prepare for your emergency for that, for chlorine exposure? What about PPE? What kind of PPE you should wear for this specific event? Uh, what are the treatment options? How long do you want to observe this, uh, the, the, the patients? I think this is an interesting question. And this is another example. St. Catherine Pool near Toronto last year again. So last year we got two big events. Uh, so they, they sent a couple of patients to hospital. As you can see, here, uh, they did some decontamination on the site with water, and uh, they did some treatment here, and then transported the, the symptomatic patients. So Calypso, St. Catherine, so it is maybe more prevalent than you think, uh, and this is likely to happen again. How does it work? Why chlorine is an irritant? So basically, you got the answer now. Chlorine is an intermediate water solubility irritant. That means that you have both characteristics of a low and a high water solubility return. It's just in between. Uh, when chlorine uh, gets in contact with water, uh, it could be water in the eyes, the throat, uh, the upper respiratory tract, uh, it produces hydrochloric acid, HCl, hypochlorous acid, HOCl, and also free radicals. Free radicals are going to be uh, involved with inflammation process and uh, epithelium, epithelium injuries inside the, uh, the deeper, uh, lower respiratory tract. So basically, solubilization and production of an acid, free radical, and bronchoconstriction because of the, the hyperreactivity, uh, these are the three mechanisms of injury for uh, chlorine exposure. So, I will come back for chlorine. I will come uh, back to chlorine just after. I just want to talk two slides on a, one specific product. Uh, so this is the case 2B. Uh, you got a male, 60 years old, who was cleaning the bathroom and decided to clean the toilet with a super mix of bleach and ammonia. Got a very sudden, sudden onset of upper respiratory tract burning, coughing, and choking. What's the substance? Involved. What is the substance released by this mix? Is anybody know that? No? It's chloramine. So chloramine is a bit different than chlorine. Chlorine is an intermediate water solubility written, and chloramine is a high water solubility written. So is the management is the same? Yeah. So we're going to just take one slide to explain the chloramine, and then we go back to chlorine, because it's about the same management. So, chemistry 101. Sorry. So, chloramine is a high water solubility irritant. It is produced by the mix of bleach and ammonia. And chloramine reacts with water to produce HOCl, a bit like chlorine, but also produce ammonia. So, you're going to produce ammonia inside your throat, your eyes, your, uh, your mouth, everything that is in contact with water. 
And you're going to also produce oxygen radicals. As most eye water solubility irritants, most of the symptoms are going to be over the upper respiratory tract. But if you get very severe exposure, su sustained exposure, you are in a closed environment, you breathe a lot of this uh, mix, you can have lower respiratory tract injury as well. So it's not a perfect rule. Usually you're going to have upper respiratory tract symptoms, but you can also have lower if you get very severe exposure. So, but the management is going to be similar to chlorine, and we're going to talk about chlorine management. So high water solubility retent, you get chloramine, you get ammonia, and you also have another gas that we're going to talk about, about it a bit later. Manifestation. So as I said, it is intermediate, so a mixed presentation. You're going to have, following a mild to moderate exposure, you're going to have uh, some irritation, some cough, and some chest tightness, as I said. But with severe or prolonged exposure, you're at risk of having upper respiratory tract edema, strider, laryngospasm, and airway obstruction. Uh, you can also have some wheezing and bronchospasm, again, if you are having a more severe exposure, and that, this can lead to pulmonary edema as well. Don't forget that chlorine was a chemical weapon in the World War I, and there is a lot of deaths related to uh, chlorine exposure in these, uh, uh, at that time. So decontamination is a very controversial topic. Should we decontaminate patients following chlorine exposure? Who say yes? Who say no? Yeah, so it's a great question, and it's a, it's a great answer. So some authors will say it's not, uh, you don't have to decontaminate, it's just inhalation, it's just a gas, it's very volatile, so it's, it's not a big deal, so bring your patient and emerge. And that's it. But uh, on the other hand, there is a couple cases of secondary contamination with chlorine. So this is why you should take a decision. It's your judgment. So I'm going to maybe expose you a couple factors to consider to decide if you decontaminate or not. Depend of the exposure. Is it only a simple gas exposure, like uh, pool, uh, like the pool incident? Usually, it's just the people around the pool just going to have some gas, some inhalation. It won't be too much contaminated. But the guy who did the maintenance w could be uh, in contact with uh, liquid chlorine. Then the game is going to be much different. Uh, do you have any soap clothes? Because you can have solubilization of the, uh, or dilution of the, uh, the, uh, the volatile chlorine on your wet clothes. And you could be, uh, your clothes can be contaminated uh, because of that. Do you have any prolonged exposure? Type of event. Is it only a simple pool incident, or it is more an industrial incident, any explosion? Then I would suggest you to decontaminate. Is there any mass casualties? I don't know if you remember the picture at St. Catherine's Pool. Um, when you get a small event, it's really easy to contain the situation and to decontaminate everybody. But when you get a very massive uh, incident, a big incident, it's very hard to contain the situation, and many people are going to uh, uh, seek medical attention without uh, being seen by the medic first. And finally, even if the patient has been decontaminated, just make sure that they have been adequately uh, decontaminated, and uh, that's it. So if you can just picture this, uh, this slide in your mind, this is the factor to consider uh, if you want to decontaminate the patient. Uh, so again, it's not a, white, a black or white answer, uh, but this is the things that you should consider. If you get any uh, concerns, maybe better to be prudent and decontaminate. And also, Poison Center can be helpful with, to take the decision. Uh, FYI, the Ontario Ministry of Health guidelines uh, for decontamination for chlorine, this is what they say. They said that if the patient is decontaminated on site after inhalation, there is no specific PPE and no decontamination. Just bring the patient and emerge and treat. If patients are contaminated, they don't specify how much contaminated they are, but if they are contaminated, they suggest level CPP with the full mask. Okay? It is a bit aggressive, I, I have to admit, but if you got just a pool incident, a pool, just a N95 may be sufficient, but if you got a, an explosion in an industrial plant and uh, that kind of stuff is a bit more uh, dirty, I would suggest you obviously to, uh, to wear the PPE level C. Uh, this is the recommendation of the Ministry of Health. And if you get any concern about residual contamination, just treat as contaminated. Treatment. So uh, 
support, support, support. It's not rocket science, just oxygen, uh, beta agonist, or salbutamol should be sufficient. For, there is other option to consider, corticosteroid. For those who are gonna develop RADS, you may think about giving uh, corticosteroids, but again, there is no real study comparing people uh, who had corticosteroid and those who, uh, uh, comparing to uh, other two didn't, who didn't have the, um, who didn't take the corticosteroids, sorry. So there is no big study to say that we should give it prophylactically, but I think that if you get any asthma-like exacerbation, it could be ind indicated, so just to consider. Don't give it to everybody, but just for those who you think are gonna benefit. Uh, one question that been raised is, uh, should we give nebulized bicarb? So we got only, only one study, only one uh, randomized control trial. So the hypothesis was, if we give bicarb, we're gonna neutralize the acid inside the lungs and maybe help the patient. So the randomized 44 patients uh, exposed with chlorine, they got all RADs, so uh, bronchospasm, and they give bicarb, so diluted uh, at 4.2%, 4, uh, 4 and they test the pulmonary function test at 0, 20, 120, and 240 minutes. And they also assess the asthma uh, life quality questionnaire. Basically, the only thing they found is a very small increase in the FEV1 in the bicarb group here. So only at 120 minutes and 240, and it's only a mild increase. This is the only thing that is significant in the, story, in the, uh, in the study. One thing that is interesting that they didn't publish any numbers. So we have to calculate here that the, increase, the difference between the group is about 500 cc. So if you want to increase the FEV1 of 500 cc of your patient, you may consider this therapy, okay? Interesting thing, the PFC, the PEF, so the peak flow, there is no difference. So FEV1, yes, but peak flow, no. So this is the only study we have. So basically, it is an option to consider. I don't think it is robust enough to use it to everybody, but just think about it. One thing giving bicarb to somebody who got ammonia exposure, it's not a good thing because you're gonna mix two alkaline solutions together. Chlorine disposition, so a big question. If you get patient with mild exposure, like a pool incident, patient just having minor symptom, sore throat, some coughing, that's it. With normal vital signs, these patients can be DC home, we just say, if you got any symptoms, come back. It's gonna be sufficient. If people are having mild to moderate symptoms, some wheezing, some DSAT, 90, 92%, or any people having pre-existing uh, disease, these patients should be observed six hours. It is unlikely that pulmonary edema is gonna happen after six hours. There is case reports, but very unlikely. So usually you, you're safe after six hours. If the patient improves after six hours, usually it's a, it's a good cutoff to discharge a patient. If, patient. if patient is still symptomatic after six, then should consider admission. Case four, this is a real case we had uh, in Quebec City uh, four years ago, five years So it's a small rural emergency, and the emergency doc just received about 12 to 15, I don't remember the number of patients you've seen initially, but just imagine 15 hockey players coming overnight between two o'clock and four o'clock, all complaining the same thing, chest tightness, hypoxemia, DSAP, uh, coughing, hemoptysis, shortness of breath, uh, what happened? What gas is involved? What's the mechanism of injury? And what's the complication related to this inhalant? So uh, the answer is nitrogen dioxide and the gas was produced by the uh, Zamboni. So this is just my prediction, by the way. <laughs> uh, so nitrogen dioxide. Two sources of exposure. First, the silo. So any fermentation of corn or any other cereals can produce NO2. So farmers having a silo, working in a silo, are, are at risk of NO2 exposure. And Zamboni. This is the other most reported uh, exposure. Uh, it is a low water solubility retent. It's a bit like phosgene. Phosgene is a gas used during the World War I. Uh, it is very uh, powerful uh, uh, chemical warfare if I can say that. So basically, uh, phosgene, just FYI, uh, is just used now to, uh, in, uh, some, uh, in the synthesis of some organic compound, but it's not something that we see very often. It's more the old school chemical warfare. 
So uh, basically, the low water solubility uh, irritants are going to have no or very mild upper respiratory tract uh, irritation. So they can stay on scene uh, in being in the, uh, in the contaminated environment for a while because they don't feel the symptoms. And 8 to 12 to 24 hours later, then they're going to have all the acids in, in the, at the bottom of their lungs producing acid again and having the uh, uh, permalium edema. So it's a very late, uh, uh, it's a late presentation. So the mechanism of injury, it's when you mix NO2 with water, you produce nitric acid, nitrous acid, and free radical. But again, you don't feel the symptoms, so we're going to go deep in your lungs, and you're going to have symptoms only 8 to 12 hours after exposure. So there is three phasic presentation. So first, some mild irritation following pulmonary edema after 8 to 24 hours. And there is also a late complication for all the low water solubility retent. So they are at risk of developing bronchiolitis obliterans. It's a rest pathology, uh, and uh, it is described with NO2 exposure. One interesting complication with NO2 is uh, methemoglobinemia. So because you get some absorption of NO, uh, the NO can bind with the hemoglobin and produce and get oxidized, oxidize, oxidize, yeah, and uh, produce methemoglobinemia. So I suggest you these patients first to get a long period of observation, we're going to talk about it, but also to dose the methemoglobinemia. So this position, if you get a significant exposure but no symptoms, it could be safe to observe your patient at least eight hours, okay, because this patient is going to decompensate eight, 12 hours after. Also, if the patient is symptomatic, is having hypoxemia, shortness of breath, we recommend to, uh, to observe at least 24 hours. And uh, also, when we get a significant exposure, they suggest to have follow-up to have a pulmonary function test. Okay? So think about late complication, methemoglobinemia, and prolonged uh, observation for NO2 exposure. FYI, the, the case we had in Quebec, we got 20 patients who seek medical attention, seven admission, and two ICU. So uh, it was a big event. So yeah, this is why I want to talk about it. Last case. Uh, so this case is going to be a bit longer because I think it's the most interesting one. You got a 17-year-old male accidentally fell into a manor pit while doing some maintenance. His father tried to extricate him and just collapsed in the pit. The uncle came and saw the two and decided to help and get down the pit, get out, uh, get down into the pit, and collapse. This is a classic example. That happened again in my region uh, in 2005. And uh, it wasn't exactly like this. There is two victims and both uh, been saved, surprisingly. So this is 5A. Do you know what gas is involved? Not sure? Yeah. So 5B is the same gas, other situation. You got a male, 30 years old is found in a locked car just behind a Home Depot. First responder arrived and looked closely to the, the, the door and see some empty bottles of cleaning products. Questions. What is the gas involved? What precaution first responder should take? And how do you manage victims? So the answer is hydrogen sulfide. Hydrogen sulfide is naturally product by uh, organic matter decomposition uh, in matter pit, in uh, petroleum, distillation, refining industry, and uh, all the oil industry as well. So this is something very common. It is a colorless uh, gas and is having a very strong rotten egg odor. But beside that, it is easily produced by mixing two things, a strong acid and sulfide compound. And these two products are easy to find. Uh, any acid battery is going to be OK, sufficient to produce H2S. And you just have to find sulfide compound at the Home Depot or any place that sell that. So I want to talk about Japanese suicide. Have anybody heard about this before? One, two, three, four, five, maybe. Uh, Japanese suicide is a technique described uh, on some Japanese website in 2007. A few months after, in 2008, the first six months of 2008, they had 
517 cases of suicide, successful suicide, following H2H2S uh, uh, exposure. So this crossed the ocean, obviously, and came to the US. In US, in 2008, two cases only. In 2009, 10 cases. 2010, 18 cases. There's a trend here. And over the, uh, the, ter over the 30 cases, there is five reports of first responder injured because people were not feared, or not feared, but uh, they were not enough, uh, they didn't take enough precaution because they're not, they're not aware of the danger of this gas. Canada, there is no official report, but what we know is the EMS Calgary Service reported six cases in the last two years. And guess what? There is a recent case here in Ontario, in Renfrew country. They found a guy unresponsive in a car with many chemicals in the car, and uh, they called the asthma team, they extricated the patient, it was obviously dead. And uh, so yeah, we had a case uh, recently. So think about it, it's coming. It, it, there's a trend here. So H2S. H2S, uh, the mechanism of injury, it, there is three mechanisms of injury. First, it is an asphyxiant. It just replace, displace the oxygen, it just uh, de uh, decrease the FiO2. Uh, especially in the manor pit, because it's heavier than air. Than air. So anybody get the, that get down on the, the pit, going to have low FiO2 because all the H2S going to be over the, the, the surface. It is a high water solubility retent, very high, very powerful retent. You're going to smell it and rotten eggs odor, it's very awful. And it is a blood agent, surprisingly. It's a, it's a bit like cyanide. So basically, uh, it's the same pattern of, uh, for the mechanism of toxicity. It binds uh, reversibly the cytochrome oxidase in the mitochondria. It inhibits the phosphorylation oxidative, and it, it, it impairs the oxygen utilization. So basically, you're gonna have an uh, anaerobic metabolism following that. At low concentration, you're gonna have the irritation. Okay, it's very easy to detect. At low concentration, you're gonna smell it. And the pitfall here, or the, uh, the danger, is when you increase your concentration, you're gonna have an olfactive fatigue. So you, your nose won't be able to smell it anymore. So you can feel that you're not in a dangerous zone at this point, but you're in a very dangerous uh, concentration. So at around 500 uh, ppm, you're gonna have respiratory symptoms, you're gonna have pulmonary edema, uh, you're gonna have arrhythmia, cardiac, uh, myocardial depression, and a lot of CNS uh, symptoms, so confusion, seizure, and coma. At high concentration, it's an instantaneous uh, respiratory paralysis. So people stop breathing, and they just collapse. It's rapid. It's sudden like a sudden. Just FYI, following the recent um, cases in Calgary, they did the, a simulation. So they took one liter of uh, sulfur uh, compound, one liter of acid. They mix it together in a car. Guess how many ppm they had after two minutes? 8,000, okay? So it is a very, uh, I, I hope there is no suicidal piece of person here, but it is a very powerful technique. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so the first priority for the H2S, it's the extrication. So it is a big threat for first responder. We can think about the five cases of first responder who get injured in US, but we can also think about the Kimberley incident in BC in 2006. Uh, there is two uh, person, unconscious person in a mine in BC, in Kimberley, and two paramedics decided to extricate them without any specific PPE. And guess what? They enter into the mine and they collapse and they died, okay? So we lost two uh, paramedics in, in that incident. So it is a real threat. So we have to do a lot of prevention and education on this gas. Um, so always have a level APP when you're uh, dealing with H2S for a hot zone. In the, um, in, for the hospital response, you should wear level CPP. So there is no question here. It's not like chlorine. Here, there is no question. You should wear level CPP. If you're gonna need um, uh, call, any patch that, that the guy is found uh, in a manor pit to having exposed to H2S, you should set up your decon uh, area and having a couple uh, staff wearing uh, the level CPP to do a formal decon.
So what do we do with these patients? Uh, basically, you have to treat the irritant complement. So you have to treat the irritation, so with oxygen, uh, bronchodilators, and probably intubation and, uh, if needed. Also, like cyanide, you can have some metabolic acidosis with high anemia, with high lactate. And again, like cyanide, you can have a normal uh, venous PU2. And chest X-ray may show a massive pulmonary edema following a good exposure. So there is a couple treatment described to treat H2S. One is the induction of methemoglobinemia, because we know that methemoglobinemia have a better affinity with the H2S compared to cetochrome oxidase and H2S. So we think it could be helpful to uh, detoxify the, uh, the organism, uh, the, uh, the body, uh, by inducing methemoglobinemia. Question is, when is the best timing? Uh, there is no answer for that. Uh, the case, not a case report, but the studies in animals show that as soon as you give the uh, nitrotherapy, better going to be the outcome. But in our system, it's going to take a while before you have the patient, so you're going to have some delay. Is it still, um, uh, do you still going to have benefit to give the, the nitrotherapy even after one hour post exposure? We don't know this answer, this answer. But if the patient is very symptomatic, I mean cardiovascular wise or neurologic neurologically wise, it could be an option to consider. If, there is, if the patient only got respiratory symptoms, irritating symptoms, uh, I don't think it is something that you should consider, especially because you get some side effects of inducing methemoglobinemia, hypotension, and exacerbation of tissue hypoxemia. So you have to think twice before giving that. If you want to give it, we think it is better to give it as soon as possible. Again, FYI, we had a, a case in Hôtel du Lévis where, uh, I, where I came from. Uh, couple of guys who fell into a manor pit and uh, they just received the patient. They just received the patient. They have been decontaminated on site. Uh, they, they stay in the garage. They give nit the nitrotherapy right away. They intubate the patient because they just, uh, not, they, they, they didn't become VSA, but they, they became unstable just after nitrotherapy. And uh, following that, uh, they just been to the uh, HBO just after. And both of them, who was initially unconscious, have a good neurological recovery. So it's a case report, but it's a happy ending. Uh, so this is uh, my introduction to talk about HBO. This is something that you may consider as well uh, if you get the possibility to send your patient there. So it's not recommended to transfer your patient to an HBO facility, but if you get it readily, uh, rapidly available, it is something that you can consider. We think it can inhibit the sulfide citrochrome binding. It, we think that it promotes the sulfide detoxification. And also we think it reduces the post-exposure tissue uh, injury. But again, it is uh, only some small case report. There is a couple positive one. There is other that doesn't show any uh, improvement. So it's something that you can consider. This position, what you should do with these patients? So. Uh, if you had no pulmonary or uh, CNS uh, symptoms, you can DC home after four to six hours of observation. This is the perfect example. It's going to be a uh, first responder that has been a bit exposed with the gas, uh, having some very mild irritation symptoms. You should observe, it, uh, observe the guy for four to six hours. It's going to be sufficient. Uh, but if you got any respiratory symptoms, they suggest to monitor for 24 hours uh, because there is some delayed pulmonary edema reported. And if you got any cardiovascular or neurologic symptoms, then admission, obviously, but as, uh, also consider uh, nitrotherapy. So this is the end of my five case. So I got three slides of summary. Uh, this is six points. Uh, this is my approach when you, when you have uh, inhalation injury uh, patients. So this is a uh, first step is try to identify the inhalant. You can always call the, uh, the, uh, the dispatch. You can have information from EMS, from ASMAT, to have information about what gas is involved. You can also call Poison Center. It can be helpful sometimes. So you got a, a, a product that you got just the name. You don't know what is inside. You can call uh, Poison Center. They are giving a lot of information. Some hints that you can have with patients is just tell them, is there any specific odor? Is it a bleach odor? Is there any rotten eggs odor? That can help be helpful into differentiating between gas. Did you see anything? Uh, 
the case with the hockey players, the NO2. Uh, the, the hockey players remember that there is a kind of a reddish and brownish haze over the, the eyes during the game. They didn't mention it to anybody, but they remember that after a while. So uh, with uh, the retrospectoscope. So uh, basically, ask patient about, did you see something? Did you smell something? And did you have any irritation symptoms? And how soon these symptoms started? Uh, how fast this, the, the, uh, the symptoms started? So it could be a full by differentiating uh, high to intermediate to low water solubility irritants. Second step is try to determine the exposure level. The exposure level, sorry. What was the concentration of the gas? What was the duration of exposure? Is it a control or uncontrolled event? Is the environment was confined or not? This information is going to be helpful for disposition and treatment and uh, complication. Next step is try to determine the potential for secondary contamination. Riot control agents, obviously there is risk of contamination. You should decontaminate with level D plus. Chlorine, it's a gray zone. You use the judgment. You use the factors I said. Uh, and for H2S, obviously it's a full decon with level C. NO2 and low water solubility, usually they don't really need a decon because the exposure was 12 hours ago and it's only usually inhalation. The, it's unlikely that they've been uh, in contact with uh, uh, a high concentration enough to produce uh, secondary contamination. Provide emergency support uh, care, so oxygen bronchodilators is the only treatment that is recommended. You can consider uh, corticosteroids if you get any suspicion of RADS and treat complication like ocular and burns. Next step is try to determine the need for any specific treatment. So NO2, think about dosing the methemoglobinemia and treat it if it is high. I mean, usually it's 30% with symptoms. This is usually the, the threshold to treat methemoglobinemia. Induce methemoglobinemia if you get H2S. And consider HBO as well for H2S. And finally, try to determine the need for observation and admission. So you're going to have to play with the water solubility, the exposure, any pre-existing condition for the patient, and obviously pediatric patients are a bit more at risk. So this is the last uh, thing. So this is the six-step approach with inhalation injury. So again, no, it's okay. <laughs> so post-test, now that you are good. Uh, ammonia, is it low? Intermediate or high? High? Perfect. Chloramine, is it A, B, or C? Chloramine, it's high. Hydrogen sulfide, is it low, intermediate, or high? It's high. Chlorine, low, intermediate? Intermediate. So I'm going to show you my graph. It's going to be better. <laughs> <laughs> I spent so much time to do this graph, so <laughs> I want to show you that. So uh, this is the water solubility. So, voyons, ça marche pas. Yeah. So high water solubility irritants like chloramine, ammonia, and H2S are gonna produce upper respiratory tract irritation very soon. Chloramine, chlorine gonna be intermediate, so a mixed presentation, and phosgene and NO2 gonna be the uh, low water solubility return, going to produce some lower respiratory tract irritation, going to be a more uh, late presentation. You can take pictures if you want. <laughs> this is the, the, the most important slide of the presentation. <laughs> so which of these gas uh, exposure can be treated by inducing methemoglobinemia? Everybody? By inducing, not a complication. So this is a, a pitfall. So NO2 can produce methemoglobinemia because there is NO that can be absorbed and NO can produce methemoglobinemia. But as, uh, uh, as cyanide, H2S, can be treated by inducing methemoglobinemia because methemoglobinemia is going to bind with H2S and detoxify the, uh, the, uh, the body with that. Okay? What's the best treatment to decrease pain following uh, CSS exposure? Time. So everything is the same, so the time is the answer. So what's the treatment for symptomatic patients following chlorine exposure? Support and Ventolin, and you can consider steroids. And honestly, I don't think I will recommend uh, use bicarb. 
uh, as because we don't have any super, any evidence that say that going to make a difference. So I want to thank uh, thanks uh, Dr. Dion, thank you very much, Dr. Maloney, thank you very much, and Dr. Andrew Reed, which is a eMERGE doc at the uh, Kingston, uh, which is the medical director at UPP, who helped me with the riot control agents part. So merci beaucoup everybody. I hope you learn a few things, and uh, I can answer to your question if you have. My pleasure. <laughs> Bye, voila. <laughs> it's going to be a FR question next year. Yes. Unfortunately, the last case we had in Renfrew Country, he didn't put any signs on the. Uh, yeah. And when? Sorry. The person. No. So there is two reasons why they do that, because they don't want to kill anybody first, but they don't want anybody to open the door two minutes after the, uh, they get exposed. So they want to make sure that it's going to work, and nobody's going to open the door and dissipate the gas. So, yes? Great presentation. Um, for all the residents, you should have taken a picture of that. I just have one. And secondly, for the hydrogen sulfide, my understanding was Yes. Compared to cyanide, I just want, I have to talk to the micro. <laughs> so uh, compared to cyanide, I, I agree. So it is reversible. And uh, cyanide is irreversible, and the uh, H2S is reversible. Right. Uh, yeah. so, uh, so at first, I, I guess now my change is, I think, so I'm switching, I guess, the kinetic relationship. And if the nitrates to reduce the kinetic relationship, for this talk, I would. Yeah, uh, the case report say that we, 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 may, uh, we may consider this therapy. So just make sure that in the daily kit, as far as I remember, there is the teosulfate, and you should not give teosulfate. Because, FYI, if you want to diagnose a H2S uh, poisoning, you can dose the teosulfate in the blood. It is uh, the byproduct of the H2S degradation. Okay? So if you degrade, uh, I'm sorry for my... Let's go. Uh, so if you degrade your H2S, by the end you're going to have thiosulfate. So if you uh, want to diagnose that, just titrate or just dose the uh, thiosulfate. So you should not give it because obviously it is one of the product, the byproduct of the uh, reaction. So yes, so you can use the lily kit with the EMP that you can inhale and the other IV, uh, uh, IV nitrates. If you can find a lily kit because they've been discontinued and uh, they'll expire over Near future, that we take off the market. The other thing, one thing we should uh, remember with chlorine: the biggest uh, mass evacuation in civilian population uh, in the world happened in Toronto in 1979, where over 200,000 people were evacuated to a derailment of a, a train carrying chlorine. A huge plume, uh, huge evacuation, the largest until uh, New Orleans. And everyone expects that with all the uh, terrorist threats, everybody's surprised that this hasn't come up as a, a likely terrorist activity because it's so obviously available to anybody that wants to blow a train off the track. So there's a, also a demonstration today if anybody's working, 20,000 people on Parliament Hill. Uh, if you see tear gas, it wouldn't surprise you. All those strong anti abortion types, you just never know. <laughs> And don't forget to get fit tested. It is important. 
Maybe we're going to have an even next month. We don't know. Thank you very much.